Okay, hi. Now, in this video, we're going to speak about chemical equilibrium. Now, this is a concept which is very much related to reversible reactions. And if you haven't watched the vid my video on reversible reactions, please do have a look at that before you carry on. Okay, so let's just recap. In a reversible reaction, you will have two things. Let's just use an example. So two reactants, nitrogen and hydrogen. Okay, and they will make ammonia. Now, this isn't balanced for a start. We need three of those and we need two of these and this is now balanced. But you'll notice that I've only drawn a single headed arrow going forwards because nitrogen and hydrogen do make ammonia, but ammonia itself can break down to make hydrogen and nitrogen. And that is just as possible. It doesn't mean that they're equally as likely. And that is what we're going to go on to in chemical equilibrium. This arrow here, you should recognize, tells you that this reaction is reversible. We can go forwards and we can go backwards. But what this arrow doesn't tell you is, well, how reversible is it? Is it 50-50? Because by this arrow, you might think, well, forwards and backwards are just as likely and it should be half of this and half of this going backwards and it's all even. But that's not the case. It depends completely on the reaction and the reaction conditions as to how much of the nitrogen and hydrogen in this case are going to make the ammonia and vice versa. Any other reversible reaction, it's the same thing. All right. And so in your book, you have a um, example where you have, let's say, A plus B gives you C plus D. And so obviously A, B, C and D are just four different chemicals. There we go. Now let's say for example that we start off only with A and B. So we add A to B and then we let it go and we see what happens. Well what actually happens? At the start we have loads of A and B and we have none of C and D. Right? Now as the reaction goes on, we get less of A and B and slightly more of C and D. So if I were to say at the start we've got A and B and we've got no C and D, right? Then we get A and B and slightly more C and D. Now, as this goes on, we reach what is known as equilibrium. And that is not when we have an equal amount of A, B, C and D. Let's say the equilibrium is reached like so. We don't have an equal amount here. But what equilibrium means is that the rate of reaction forward is equal to the rate of reaction backwards. Okay, so at equilibrium, I'm just going to write EQ for short. Rate of reaction forward is equal to rate of reaction backwards and that makes sense because it means at that point there is no net change in the amount of a b c and d so here it doesn't matter how long we leave the reaction now a b is always going to be this amount and c and d is always going to be this amount that's because as a b is converted into c and d and c d increases well at exactly the same time c d is being reduced back to AB at the same rate, which means that we have a constant forward and backward, which means no net change in the amount of reactants and products. Whereas at this one, let's say at the second point, well, the reaction backwards is slightly faster than the reaction forwards. And that is why we end up with more C and D than we do up here, because overall, Sorry, that's the that's the wrong way around. The reaction forwards is quicker than the reaction backwards because more AB is converted into CD, leading us to this final scenario here. So, sorry about that. Going backwards from CD is slower at this second stage because we are producing more C and D as equilibrium has not been reached yet. Now, because when we reach equilibrium, it's not that everything stops and we just have A, B, C, and D as they are. It's just that the rates are the same. We call this dynamic equilibrium. Dynamic equilibrium. 
The dynamic just tells you that no, the reaction hasn't finished. It just means that things are going backwards and forwards at the same rate. Now, it's important as well that what we've been talking about and what really you'll always talk about is a closed system. Closed system. And what that means is that no reactants can get in or out. So reactants and products can't get in and they can't get out because this means that everything is made to balance. Oh, sorry. Because this means that everything is made to balance as it is. Because if we added more of something or we took something away, then we'd have to reach equilibrium again. So when things are changed, so the conditions are changed or the amounts of chemicals are changed, then equilibrium needs to reach, needs to be reached, sorry, again. So that's something that's very important because a lot of chemical reactions uh, which are carried out for industry, they are reversible reactions. And so we need to pick the correct conditions in order to obtain a, as much product as we can. So let's just say, let's just use A, B, C and D again making C plus D. Now let's say that, for example, C was really important for us, right? We really wanted to make C, and so we want to produce as much of it as possible. Okay, now let's say that we've reached equilibrium, and that's fine. But we don't have as much C as we really want. Um, so what we're gonna do is, as C and D are being produced, we're gonna take them out. So remove C and D as they are produced. This means that it is no longer a closed system because we're changing the conditions. So now that C and D are being removed, well the equilibrium actually moves to the right and it says, well actually, there's not a lot of C and D here and so we're gonna make more of it. So as we take out C and D, what we've got is A, B and we've got no C and D, right? So the equilibrium again goes, well, let's make more of it. So the forward reaction is faster than the reverse. And so we reduce the amount of A and B and we make more C and D, right? Now, let's say that, for example, this is now equilibrium. Well, now we're going to take C and D out again. So we take them out, making a small amount of C and D. And now the equilibrium's like, hang on, that's not fair. Now we need to make more of it. So, we reduce the amount of A and B again, and we reach another equilibrium where we've created more C and D again, and so on and so on and so on. And we can keep doing that, and that means that we can obtain as much product as we can. Now, it's not as simple as that sometimes. Sometimes that's a lot more difficult to do than just taking them out, but in theory, that's a way that we can do it. Now what this tells us is that when we change the conditions of an equilibrium, the equilibrium will move to try and cancel out that change. So I'm gonna say in general, if we change conditions, the equilibrium, I'm just gonna write EQ, will move to reduce or cancel the change. So when we take out C and D, we're reducing the concentrations of C and D. And so the equilibrium is gonna to move to increase the concentrations of C and D, and thus canceling out the change. And that brings us on to more conditions which um, we can change in order to cause the equilibrium to shift. And so the next condition I want to talk about is pressure. And so this is obviously important when we're dealing with reactions involving gases. Okay, and so I'm going to use the example that I stated previously, which is the Harbour process, which is nitrogen plus um, hydrogen makes ammonia. Right, that's not balanced, so we need three of those and two of those, and all of these are going to be gases, okay? nitrogen, hydrogen, and ammonia all as gas. And so we can clearly see that the molar relationships here are not equal. If I'm going to speak in the simplest terms, what it means is that one molecule, molecule of nitrogen plus three molecules of hydrogen 
makes two molecules of ammonia. Okay, now if I'm speaking uh, a bit more generally, we can just say moles, 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 moles. Okay, so what this really means is that at the start of the reaction, we are going to have more moles of gas than we are at the end of the reaction because we have four moles of gas on the left-hand side and two moles of gas on the right-hand side. And this is where it's interesting because, remember, if we increase or decrease a condition, the equilibrium wants to move to reduce that change. So, let's say, for example, I increase the pressure. So, if I increase pressure. Well, there is obviously going to be a higher pressure if you have more molecules of gas than if you have less molecules of gas. So if I increase the pressure, the equilibrium is going to move to reduce the change. So the EQ moves to the right. Okay, so it moves that way. That's because creating more ammonia will reduce the pressure. So what it's doing is it's reversing the change. Now, if I reduce the pressure, this is after we've reached equilibrium, remember. So I'm changing, I'm, I'm basically changing a condition after equilibrium's already been reached. If I reduce the pressure, the equilibrium is going to move to reverse that change. So it's going to increase. So the equilibrium moves to the left because if I create more reactants that makes four molecules of gas whereas on the right I have two molecules of gas the pressure goes up so it moves to the left and that is to counteract the reduction in pressure because creating the, pro the, uh, the reactants again will increase the pressure okay so I hope that makes sense lastly we're going to talk about energy energy so this is changing the temperature normally. So you know that we have endothermic and exothermic reactions. If you're not clear on those terms, please have a look at my video where I cover the topics before we go on. So endothermic and exothermic. Endothermic obviously means that it takes in energy from the surroundings and the temperature goes down. Exothermic means it releases energy and the temperature will go up. Now I'm gonna use an example reaction, but if a reaction is reversible, one way will be exothermic and the other way will be equally endothermic. So if I have H2O plus carbon, reversibly making carbon monoxide and hydrogen, now, let's just put the state symbols in really quick. Solid. And these two are obviously both gases. Now, what I'm going to say is that the forward reaction is endothermic. Okay. That means that the reverse reaction is exothermic. So, let's say that these things are reacting and we let them reach equilibrium. All right. Let me just rub out these words at the top just to... Uh, avoid confusion. If these are allowed to reach equilibrium, then we have um, the forward and the reverse reaction at the same rate. What we're looking at now is what happens when we change the conditions. What we're going to do is we're going to change the temperature. So let's say I increase temperature. Pause the video now and think what would happen to the equilibrium. Okay, so I hope you had a go. Now, increasing the temperature means that the equilibrium is going to want to reduce the temperature. Now, in order to reduce the temperature, that is what happens in an endothermic reaction because energy is taken in. And so that means what is going to happen is the equilibrium will move to the right because the forward reaction, the one to the right, is endothermic and that takes in heat energy and reduces the temperature so if i've increased the temperature the equilibrium will move to reduce it and so it will go down the endothermic route 
Now, obviously, what is going to happen then if I reduce the temperature? Well, the equilibrium will move to the left. Because if I reduce the temperature, now the equilibrium wants to move to increase the temperature again, so counteract the change. So the backwards reaction, so carbon monoxide plus hydrogen making carbon and water, is exothermic. And so it's going to move backwards, increasing the temperature because the exothermic reaction releases energy. Okay, so that's what's happening with conditions changing, the equilibrium is going to move to reduce an external change. This is important, especially when we have a closed system, which means that nothing, uh, no reactants and products are being added or taken away, because it means that we can uh, change the conditions to get as much of what we want as we can. Okay, now in the next video, we're going to have a look at the harbour process in more detail, which is the one which makes ammonia. Um, but for now, I just wanted to make sure that those concepts are clear. So if you do have any questions on any of that, please feel free to send me a direct email using the link below or to post a comment in the box and I'll be sure to get back to you. But please, as usual, like and subscribe because there are plenty more videos coming very soon. But I look forward to seeing you in the next one.